Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we synthesize weird and wonderful science infused directly into your ears. I'm Ian Wolf. On this edition, Claudia Vickers talks about synthetic biology and the future science platform. First up, here's news about losing weight while getting younger. <music> Nanotechnology transforms fat. A team led by Associate Professor Xu Wang at Texas Tech University have embedded resveratrol in nanoparticles. Resveratrol was hopeful for lengthening life and converting white energy storage fat into brown energy burning fat. But when you take a pill of resveratrol, it isn't absorbed very much by the body. New biodegradable nanoparticles can ferry the resveratrol directly into fat cells, converting white fat into brown fat. In an animal study, resveratrol encased in the new nanoparticles caused a 40% reduction of the fat housed under the skin and a 50% reduction in visceral fat, fat that's housed inside the abdomen. It also improved insulin balance and lipid stability while reducing inflammation after only five weeks of treatment. Dr. Wang has filed a patent and received grants from the National Institutes of Health and the American Heart Association for studying the effects of the treatment on diabetes and heart disease. The latest paper was titled Resveratrol Liposomes and Lipid Nanocarriers, Comparisons of Characteristics and Inducing Browning of White Adipocytes, and was published in the journal Colloids and Surfaces B, Biointerfaces. But the research continues with the grant title Anti-Obesity Effects of Adipose Targeting Resveratrol Nanocarriers. Synthetic Biology and Future Science Associate Professor Claudia Vickers has a synthetic biology research group at the University of Queensland, where they work on metabolic engineering in microbes. Claudia is also director of the CSIRO Future Science Platform. Claudia and I connected using WebEx on the rare day during this drought that it actually rained very loudly here in Sydney. So you can hear some of that in the background and... Due to the rain, there were signal dropouts that I edited as best I could. I began by asking Claudia, how would she define synthetic biology? The generic definition that we use here is that synthetic biology is the design and construction of DNA encoded parts, devices and machines and their application for useful purposes. It's a really broad definition, but it does rely on, on several key factors. So one is that it's encodable and recodable, so the recoding of, of biology using nucleic acids and, and recoded proteins is a really important element. Another is that standardised componentry allows us to do high throughput assembly of, of different DNA parts. So automation of high throughput assembly that allows us to explore a very large solution space of biologically encoded solutions is really important as well. Any, any definition sort of needs to have a little bit of further explanation in order that you can narrow down what exactly it is that synthetic biology is. Basically, my understanding is you're saying that it's putting all the biological components together into standardised little bits, like in 
analog electronics, you have resistors and capacitors and transistors. And in digital electronics, you have standard little bits that you can put together so that the logic makes a new machine. And you're doing a similar thing in biology. Absolutely. So basically, synthetic biology is applying engineering principles like design, build, test and learn iterative cycles to biological engineering. And that it relies on concepts of abstraction and hierarchy, which are the, the concepts you just touched on there by referring to component tree. And an electrical circuit is a really nice analogy, I guess. Electrical engineering is a really nice analogy because we use transistors and all those different components that you put together on an electrical circuit to achieve a desired outcome. And ideally, we like to be able to do that with biology as well. Of course, it's not so simple with biology because transistors are fundamentally non-mutable. I mean, they might break or something, but they won't sort of convert into something else and do a slightly different job. But biology does that, and it does that because DNA is, is mutable, and that's, uh, i.e. it can mutate. And that's a fundamental principle of evolution, really important part of how biology and DNA work. But of course, it makes engineering predictable systems that much more challenging. And so if you've got these components that do pretty much the same thing every time, that makes it very reliable and copyable, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's the ultimate goal, is to have predictable, precise, reproducible, genetically encoded systems. Does it also make it more understandable? Yeah, so there's two parts of synthetic biology, obviously. Synthetic biology for solving problems and synthetic biology for answering questions. So we can also use these tools and devices that we make to investigate basic questions about how biology works. And in fact, it's really difficult to engineer a system effectively unless you really do understand how it works. And we kind of prove that we understand how it works by showing that we can engineer it predictably. Because when you're engineering something, you're actually making a prediction just like you do in an experiment. Exactly, exactly. And this is actually a really interesting conceptual difference between science that I guess the, the approach that scientists use to do science and the approach that engineers use to do science. So, so scientists are interested in answering questions, whereas engineers are interested in solving problems. And some people might argue and say, well, that's just a semantic differentiation. It's basically the same thing. And for many, many purposes, it is very similar. But actually, they, they are different things. So answering a question really relies on asking a question and then following a process to try to discover something. But solving a problem is about actually solving a problem and um, having impact and making a difference and, and then rolling out the solution to that problem and, and you know, changing the world and making it a better place, which is where, where my primary motivation comes from, is, is really moving from a, from a non-sustainable petrochemical economy to a sustainable bio-based economy. And if you're going to do that, you need to have reliable, reproducible systems and you need to be solving problems. And it's just a slightly different conceptual approach to the way that you do things. And what are some of the problems that you're investigating? Well, from my own research, we're interested in producing bio-based chemicals that can replace petrochemicals. So we have looked at biofuels previously. They're really challenging because you need to achieve production rates and yields and titers, which are really high because you burn fuels and you burn a lot of them, and that means it has to be really cheap. And to be really cheap, you need to be able to produce a lot at one time or one place. And it's difficult to engineer biological systems to meet those needs. So it's, it's doable, but on, on a small scale at the moment, and we're still working to, in, to increase those rate seals and titers in order to be effective in that biofuel space. But there's a lot of high-value chemicals, such as pharmaceuticals and mid-value chemicals, fragrances, uh, chemical feedstocks, things that are polymerized to make plastics, resins and fibers and things where we can have an impact and we can be effective in converting from petrochemical-based products to bio-based products. And ideally, of course, biodegradable products where you want them to be biodegradable so that you can plug into a circular bioeconomy. That's the sort of stuff that we do. We work in yeast, the same yeast that you use to make beer and bread and wine. It's a wonderful little organism. We also work in uh, E. coli, like a non-pathogenic non E. coli, harmless E. coli. And we work in photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria. And we're interested in those, of course, because one of the key considerations 
process is what we call the feed stock, so what goes into it. Feed, yeast, and E. coli, different sugars, and they're relatively cheap. And we might want to use you know, waste products like waste agriculture, trash, and things like that to feed into a bioprocess. That would be great, but that's, that's really challenging to, to break down to use effectively in biological systems. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get that feedstock stock, which is primarily a carbon feedstock, from the atmosphere, if it was carbon dioxide, if they could photosynthesize and convert carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into value-added chemicals. So that's why we're interested in the photosynthetic or the green cyanobacteria as chassis organisms as well. Do you look at algae? Yeah, so cyanobacteria are, are an algae. They're a microalgae, a single-celled algae. And we don't look at larger multicellular algae like your kelps and things like that. I think they're very difficult to engineer. But I think there are some groups in the world who are doing that. So that's what I do in my research program, my personal research program. But over in the CSIRO, we have a much, much broader research program that looks at many, many, many different things. So we operate in three different areas in terms of that, the, the uh, science that we deliver into. One is called uh, chemicals and fibres. So I just talked to you a bit about metabolic engineering and chemicals and fibres is our classical metabolic engineering application domain, we call it. And we also look at evaluated fibres. So can we get cotton, for example, to make a, a coloured cotton so that we don't have to go through the toxic and dangerous process of dyeing it afterwards? Can we change its physical properties so that you get cottons that are stretchy so that you don't have to iron your cotton biodegradable clothes and so that you can use a biodegradable fabric instead of petrochemical-based fibres and then you don't get microplastics and things coming from your sustainable fashion product. So that's our chemicals and fibres application vein. Environment and biocontrol is another area that we work in. So that's, of course, so three different areas. So biocontrol of invasive pests and pathogens, which is, of course, really important for Australia and for Australian agriculture, and also just for ecological systems. So, you know, invasive pests like mice and, and, and rats and, and feral cats and things. Bioremediation, so cleaning up contaminated land and water and improving ecology, ecologies. And also engineering resilience. So how do we use our technologies, our genetic technologies, to improve ecologies, ways of dealing with climate change, for example. So coral reefs, as we all know, are in terrible danger from climate change. And we will lose these coral reefs if we don't come up with some dramatic ways to help them cope with the effects of climate change. So the third area is health and medicine. So we work in a lot of different areas from vaccines to antimicrobials to implantable devices, artificial pancreas, all the sorts of different things that might contribute in the health and medical space. And we're also looking at lots of food and agriculture applications as well. So those are the science areas. We also have, so that's biophysical science, we also do a lot of work in the social sciences, looking at the social, or legal, ethical, the the policy-based considerations of how to develop effective technologies and ensure that they deliver impact into society so that they're acceptable technologies and that we're um, responsibly doing this sort of technology because, of course, it is quite, it's controversial and it's disruptive, positively disruptive, but also, you know, there are concerns about these types of technologies and that's really important for us to engage with, we have a responsibility to engage with all these uh, social aspects of this kind of technology as well. You're listening to Ian Wolfe and Claudia Vickers on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Those are a lot of the problems. What are some of the more theoretical scientific questions that you're investigating? Okay, so I'll switch back to my own research program now because that's the most familiar to me. So I'm interested in how organisms take up carbon and direct it into particular parts of their network and why they do that. So I'm particularly interested in a group of natural products called isoprenoids or terpenoids. And they have, there are about 70,000 different terpenoid metabolites or, or products that are recognized to date. So we can make biofuels and pharmaceuticals and flavors and fragrances and agricultural chemicals out of them. But they also have lots of different biological roles. So I'm, I'm interested in what roles all of these different biochemicals play in the plant's physiology and the plant's ecology. 
and I can use my synthetic biology tools to modify the carbon that moves through the plants and then through the network into different products and then try to understand what the effect of those modifications has have on how the organisms interact with their environment and how their general metabolism responds and how it behaves under those conditions. Synthetic biology is a bit of a controversial area. What are some of the misunderstandings that you have to deal with? But the public um, doesn't necessarily have a strong grasp of what synthetic biology is. In fact, the first package of work that our social science program team has done is actually to go out to the public and do a, a very large survey to engage a bit around how people understand synthetic biology, what they understand as synthetic biology, put case studies in front of them that illustrate what synthetic biology can do and what sort of impact that might have. And we haven't finished assessing all that data yet. The reports are going to be available very soon and that will be really enlightening. So that's like a baseline study and it gives us a foundation to do longitudinal studies to help understand those community attitudes a little bit better. So I think that in general the understanding of what synthetic biology is is probably relatively low. And frankly, the, the name synthetic biology is not the best name. I think there are better names, I think, that we could use that better describe what we do and, and why we do it. And something as simple as engineering biology is probably a more direct and practical and pragmatic name that come up with the name and that's what's recognised in the scientific community now. So we, we sort of, we work with what we have. That's all you can do. And... I remember from your talk that you mentioned that there was a national roadmap for synthetic biology. Yes, so the Australian Council of Learned Academies was commissioned by the Office of the Chief Scientist of Australia to develop these one of these horizon scanning reports in synthetic biology. And I was on the expert working group for that report. And it was a very thorough and broad report that looks at not just the biophysical sides of things and the strategic areas that we need to consider in the different types of biophysical sciences, but also the social, the legal, the ethical side of things as well, intellectual property and all of those areas. So the findings for that were really, I think, important to help construct this roadmap and help Australia identify where our strengths and weaknesses are and in which way we can most effectively exploit this new technology for our national benefit. And there's a lot of business interest in synthetic biology in Australia. Yeah, so the program that we run at CSIRO is called a Future Science Platform and it's really about developing the technological know-how and capability and training the next generation of leaders and making sure we have the right infrastructure in place. And we weren't really expecting to have so much interest from industry at this stage of the game, but we have had quite a lot of interest and both from national companies and from international companies who are wanting to access the expertise that we've developed and the resources and facilities that we've developed as part of this program. So we've had quite a lot of, of interest in the space and we're engaging very much so with industry who are interested in developing sustainable solutions to their particular problems. You mentioned something about responsible and disruptive. So responsible innovation Mm -hmm. is, a, is a quite a large program that we helped to establish and it's actually looking at disruptive technologies in general and that might be artificial intelligence or synthetic biology or yeah, any number of different types of, of technology and developing responsible frameworks for investigating and doing research and development in these disruptive technologies. So it's a much broader program. We do a lot of that activity internally in, inside the Synthetic Biology Future Science Program because of the nature of synthetic biology and our, what we call our Maximising Impact Social Science Application Domain works closely with the Responsible Innovation Program which is now a separate future science platform in itself and developing an enormous amount of novel capability in that. And really, as I said before, I see this as our responsibility to engage effectively across the range of aspects of synthetic biology as a technology, including the social, which is really important if we want to deliver real impact from the technology. And of course, university students are getting involved with some of these iGEM and some of the other challenges with synthetic biology competitions around the world. Yeah, so iGEM has been just an absolute groundswell and has really led the way in terms of 
undergraduate training and postgraduate supportive training in synthetic biology internationally. And there's a huge competition that's held annually and an enormous number of people internationally that, that go to it. And it's been really instrumental in developing synthetic biology as a field internationally. However, it hasn't worked very well in Australia. There are a few reasons for that. One is that we're in the Southern Hemisphere. We're a long way from the rest of the world. So in order to engage and to attend the, the National IGEM competition event, it's incredibly expensive for Australian teams. And the timing doesn't work out very well because we have different timings for our semesters than they do in the Northern Hemisphere. And so it hasn't really taken off in Australia. We only field four to six teams and sometimes even fewer per annum, which is not very many considering our population. So we've really, in many ways, we've missed out on this, the, the momentum that the IGEM competition has built. And we're actually in the process now, there's a consortium of, of young scientists who are building and developing an Australian Synthetic Biology Challenge competition, which will be more bespoke, bespoke to the Australian needs, much, much cheaper to engage with, and much more sort of equitable relative to the Australian environment, and really help drive and build that undergraduate, postgraduate training that we need in synthetic biology in Australia. Because from what I've seen, there's a very strong interest in the universities in this area, in synthetic biology. Yeah, absolutely. So many of them are building synthetic biology into their strategy at the moment. And I guess our activities, the so CSIRO's activities and outreach, so we have three three programs and one of them is um, outreach and community. So we, we run workshops, we financially support our own conferences and other conferences in, in aligned areas, help develop training and education modules and supporting the Australian synthetic biology competition is, is part of that. So we're very proactive and we recognise even from the beginning of this program that CSIRO as an organisation was too small to change the national synthetic biology capability and that we would need to be extremely collaborative and build a collaborative community of practice and training and education are a part of that obviously. So that's a big area that we're working in and a really important part in collaborating closely with the universities which we've had really fantastic experience in. So we, we work with 45 partners nationally and internationally, as I said, I think I said that earlier. And we, so we work with 18 Australian universities and medical research institutes. So we've got this fantastic collaborative network to engage with and the training and education side, as I said, is really important. And there's also the community biohacking groups around the world that are engaging in synthetic biology as mm. well. Yeah, so community science and biohacking, but they're much broader terms, I guess, than synthetic biology. So some biohacking communities do synthetic biology as part of that, and some community science groups. In Australia, there are only a few groups, I think. There's definitely one in Sydney, there's one in Brisbane, I think there's one in Melbourne as well. So it's not a huge movement in Australia, but it's a wonderful way of democratising science and allowing and, and encouraging community access to science. It's really important. So one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment is the building of a bioincubator precinct. And the bioincubator precinct is, in the first instance, provides the virtual and physical infrastructure to help bring synthetic biology technologies and advanced biotechnologies in general to impact, so translating from the lab into society. So it's a startup accelerator in the first instance, but we also are recruiting major anchor companies to help support that growth and development in a synthetic biology and broader biotechnology industry in Australia. One of the spaces in that bioincubator precinct that we, we're looking to develop is a community science and training and education hub. And I guess biohacking and, and community science more generally is an important part of that. So synthetic biology is a key enabling technology that will allow us to transition from this petrochemical-based economy to a sustainable bio-based economy. And now is a time in the history of the, the planet and in human history in particular where we've never been under a greater existential threat and danger from climate change and from our own activities on this, this planet Earth. And we don't have magical solutions the technological solutions that we can develop are urgently, urgently needed. And if we don't develop these technologies and bring them to market um, in a sustainable and ethical way, 
then it's hard to see how we'll be able to effectively transition into a, a circular economy, a bio-based economy, and how our planet will survive over the next few hundred years. Well, Claudia Vickers, thank you very much. You're most welcome, and thanks for your time, Ian. That was Claudia Vickers, Associate Professor at the University of Queensland and Director of the CSIRO Future Science Platform, talking about future science. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, 2XXFM in Canberra, and my local station, 2RDJ in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords, so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.